Well, tonight we are in session number four out of eight uh, sessions of the Bible study on biblical cosmology. All of the events leading up to the one tonight have been preparing the way for the one we'll see tonight. And the one tonight is actually a two-parter, so you'll see the first part of it tonight and the second part of it next Sunday evening, Lord willing. Again, I'll ask you to do the same thing we've been doing um, in each of these because I am recording them and going to probably at some point we'll get them edited so that if there are other people that want to to be able to go back over the material, they'll be able to do that. So if you would uh, hold any questions or comments that you have until the very end tonight, and I promise <coughs> there will be opportunity for you to, to ask questions or make comments and observations at the end tonight. So if you need to, jot Jot it down so you don't forget what your question is before we get to the end tonight. Um, I also want to say starting out that everything we've been doing up to this point, I hope that even though I haven't said this, I hope that in your mind you're building a biblical model of cosmology. We have looked at, of course, what the, the world's cosmology is, the biblical model that uh, modern science teaches, and we've looked at different aspects of it that totally disagree not only with the Bible, but with observable scientific evidence. We'll see some more of that as we go through these, these last five weeks of the study as well. But hopefully what you're also doing in addition to seeing those things that the scientists say that are wrong, hopefully you're gathering the things that the Bible says and building now a new construction in your mind of what the biblical model of cosmology is. The sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, and how they're all put together. So I hope that you'll continue doing that, and maybe at some point before we get to the end, certainly, of the study, we'll try to do that all together, but I hope you're doing that in your mind already. I want to begin with a Bible verse that we started the study uh, four weeks ago with, it is Proverbs 18, verse 13. And the Bible says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. There are a lot of people that as soon as they hear this or that or another, they automatically have an opinion one way or the other. And uh, I think probably to some degree that's just natural. We all automatically when we hear something, we automatically have an opinion one way or the other, and that opinion is solely based on what we have heard or been told uh, through the rest of our lives leading up to that point. But if we get to that point and then we don't look and examine, first of all, at Scripture and see what Scripture says about a subject, and then see what uh, true scientific evidence uh, details in addition to that, if we just judge that and make an opinion simply by what we already know, we will have missed out on what true scientific method is and also on simply going by what the Bible teaches. So I say that as my jumping off point tonight. Tonight our study, as you can see with the first slide up here, is part number four and the title of it is This Place We Call Home. So tonight we'll be talking completely about how God created the earth itself. This is a quote by Martin Luther. Now this is not Martin Luther King. This is the actual Martin Luther who started the Protestant Reformation. He wrote this in his studies on Genesis back in 1539. We Christians must be different from the philosophers in the way we think about the causes of these things. And if some are beyond our comprehension, we must believe them and admit our lack of knowledge rather than either wickedly deny them or presumptuously interpret them in conformity with our own understanding. Now, Martin Luther is writing, <clears throat> he's talking about the book of Genesis. He's talking about cosmology and the creation of the world along with the sun, the moon, and the stars. He is writing this in 1539 at the time that the, uh, the revolution in scientific cosmology was taking place with Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and all of those. He is contemporary in that time period. 
when they were taking everything that the Bible teaches and everything that mankind all over the world had believed for the first 5,500 years or so of, a, of human history, and they were turning it upside down to the things that we've talked about over the previous three studies in our study here in biblical cosmology. And his comment here is, as you read the book of Genesis, and you read the Bible, just because the Bible says something that you don't understand, or you don't understand how it could be that way, don't either deny it, just because you don't know how it could be that way, and don't try to make it just conform to what you've been told by scientists because you choose not to believe the Bible. He's saying, whatever the Bible says, just accept it as truth, whether you understand it or whether it makes sense to you and you're uh, capable of making it conform to what you've been taught in school or not. I entitled this slide, More Biblical Conundrums. A conundrum is a situation where it seems like there's no explanation no way of explaining it. In addition to the problematic verses in the Bible, I say problematic only because they, if you believe modern science, you have some real problems explaining them. In addition to the problematic verses in the Bible dealing with the sun standing still and the shadow on the sundial moving backwards that we already looked at, there remain a number of other verses which seem problematic too if one accepts the modern science model of a globe spinning through space and revolving around the sun while the entire solar system hurtles through space. Consider these. Now, some of these are stories from the Bible. Maybe you're already familiar with. I suspect there may be some of these we're about to see that maybe you're not familiar with. But let's look at them. The first one is Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. This, of course, is one of the three temptations that Satan brought to Jesus after he had been fasting and praying for 40 days in the wilderness before he started his public ministry. This temptation by Satan is where he takes Jesus up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth Him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, Here's the conundrum. If you look at the earth, you say, where could you be on a mountain, no matter how high the mountain is, and be able to see all the kingdoms of the earth? Because if you were on the top of a mountain over here, you'd not be able to see that side over there, and vice versa, or the top and the bottom. So there's the first place in Scripture where it seems to be uh, no ex explainable way that he could take him up into a mountain high enough that he could see all the kingdoms of the earth. The second one is in Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel interprets in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 4. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed, Nebuchadnezzar said. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong. And the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar saw a tree in his dream that grew so tall that from that tree you could see all the kingdoms of the earth, much the same as the mountain on which the devil took Jesus up into. Now, you could say, well, that's, that's just a dream, so maybe it was just... Uh, uh, it was it's symbolic of something. How can one see the end of all the earth at any point on the globe, even if the tree reached into heaven? How can there be an end of the earth uh, on any ball? 
Here's the next one, the Tower of Babel. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Many of the ancient lore in different cultures about Nimrod state that his intention was to build the tower high enough to reach God's throne room so that he could kill God with his bow and arrow. Now, if you were here when we had our series on Mystery Babylon about two to three years ago, you'll remember in that Wednesday night study that we did that we, we saw Nimrod and the religion of ancient Babel, Babylon, and how it became the basis for all the ancient religions around the world that still exist in one form or fashion today. And we saw that Nimrod, in all those different religions around the world, the story is basically the same from civilization to civilization, but his name, Nimrod, changes from story to story, but the story is pretty much the same. Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz being the three main characters of the story. We won't go through the story again tonight, but almost every one of those accounts, no matter where you go around the world, have the character that represents Nimrod uh, ascending up into the heavens to kill God with his bow. Now, in order to do that, he would have to build a tower that was tall enough to reach into heaven. And if you explain the cosmology the way that modern science does, why, of course, there's, there's no way you could build a tower and even think that you might could reach into the throne room of heaven. Uh, here's that next conundrum. And then here's the last one from the book of Revelation. The Bible says in Revelation 1-7, Behold, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see Him, and they also which pierced Him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. Even so, Amen. Then in Matthew 24-27, again speaking of the second coming of Christ, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The question then that makes sense to ask is how will everyone around the globe see his instantaneous return? Because if it's a ball that's spinning um, and Jesus appears in the clouds, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, how is everyone going to see him at the same time as he parts the eastern sky? That's the question. All four of these things from the Bible we've seen based upon how science says the earth is made, it makes no sense how any of those things could be true. How? We know the Bible's true. We believe it. But how are these things possible? A mountain tall enough to see all the kingdoms of the earth. A tree tall enough to see to the ends of the earth a way to get to the throne room of God, and a way for all the earth to see the instantaneous return of Christ at the second coming. What if I told you that every one of these biblical descriptions in these passages made total sense if you changed only one thing that you believe? One thing that you've been taught that is not in the Bible. One thing that you've been taught your entire life, that you accept as true, even though it's not in the Bible. One thing that no civilization on earth believed for the first 5,500 years of human history. What if that one thing, what if you change that one thing that makes these four passages all appear impossible? What if you simply change them to a biblical description of God's creation of the earth. The Bible talks about the circle of the earth. Isaiah 40 verse 22 is often quoted, but little understood. Here's what it says, It is He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, speaking of God, and spreadeth them out as a tent, to dwell in. Now, up here, pictured on the screen, 
is a circle. Don't get confused about what is a circle. It, we're not talking about the Bill Clinton definition of what is, is. It's simply a circle. You know what a circle is. That's a circle. And Isaiah 40, 22 says, God sitteth upon the circle of the earth. In other words, He's above looking down at the circle of the earth. A circle with a curtain spread above as a tent. Now here's the same verse, uh, and there's the circle on the ground. But look what else the verse says. It is He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. This is what a circle with a curtain spread above it as a tent would look like. It's not anything like what modern science says the earth looks like, but that's the way the Bible describes the appearance of the earth. What's in a word? All right, so now you're thinking perhaps circle in Isaiah 40, 22 is the same as the Hebrew word for ball. Or perhaps the different word for ball was not in use at the time that Isaiah wrote Isaiah 40, 22. Except that Isaiah also used the word for ball in the book of Isaiah. So we know he knew the difference. Isaiah did not call the earth a ball in Isaiah 40, 22. He said a circle. He called it the circle of the earth. And as I just said, he, he knew the word for ball. It wasn't a matter that he didn't know what the word for ball was or that the Hebrew language didn't have a word for ball at the time he wrote that. We know that because he used the word for ball in Isaiah 22, verse 18. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. In Isaiah 22, the word ball, I don't know the Hebrew pronunciations. Uh, I know just enough Greek to get me in trouble. Uh, but here's the word for ball in Hebrew, dur. And yet in Isaiah 40, 22, the word, the Hebrew word that in our English Bibles is translated the circle of the earth is chug or hug. And that word means circle or compass to go around something. So he didn't use the ball of the earth in Isaiah 40, 22. He said the circle of the earth. Preacher, are you just splitting hairs? Is a circle and a ball the same thing? No, they're really not. A circle and a ball are not the same thing. A circle is one-dimensional. A ball is three-dimensional. Had he wanted to use the word ball for the way God made the earth, he could have used the word ball because he knew the word for ball in his own language. But rather... Isaiah described the earth as a circle with the heavens stretched out as a tent above the circle of the earth. All right, let's continue on. And by the way, let me say as we continue on here, my desire as your pastor is simply to show you what the Bible says. I'm not going to tell you what to believe. But when we get to the end tonight, I'm going to tell you what I believe. I'm going to tell you what I believe the Bible teaches and by the time we get there, I think you're going to see for yourself without being, ha having to be told, it's going to be clear what the Bible says about the earth. You can choose to do with it what you want to, but my job is to help you see what does the Bible say about the earth and about the way God created the earth. And the same thing I've said about every week up to this point, if what you see in the Bible disagrees with what you were taught in ninth grade science class and fourth grade science class and the university, you got to choose whether you're going to believe what the Bible says or what the science book said. Perhaps that was just Isaiah though. And yet in the book of Proverbs chapter 8, verse 27, we see really the very same description of the earth that Isaiah gave. When He prepared the heavens, I was there. When He set a compass upon the face of the depth. Uh, a compass is that same word. It means circle. Uh, that same word means circle 
or compass. You remember when you were in uh, geometry class growing up, you had, a, uh, you had to bring a protractor and a compass when you got to geometry class. Well, the compass was that thing you make circles with. That's what the word compass means. It means to circle. So Proverbs says, uh, God set a compass upon the face of the deep. Job 26.10, a different book of the Bible, says, He hath encompassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. So uh, God has set a compass or a circle around the waters with a boundary. Again, you see the word for uh, circle or compass. Same word that was used in Isaiah 40.22, hug or chug. The Bible says that God created the earth as a circle on the face of the deep. Look at Proverbs 8.27. By the way, the, the book of Job and some passages in the book of Proverbs are great companions to the book of Genesis in telling us how God made everything. Not only the earth, but also the firmament and the heavens above as well. Proverbs 8.27 says, When He prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep, uh, face of the depth. What, what is the, the face of the depth to which the book of Proverbs is record is making record? Well, we simply need to go back to Genesis chapter one. We read that in uh, the eleven o'clock service this morning for a different reason. But look what it says: In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now this is the creation of the heaven and the earth. Job 38, talking about creation, gives us uh, more insight into how God created the earth on day one. The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Now, I'm going to give you my best understanding as your preacher on this passage. All of these passages are talking about the deep. The face of the deep. The deep is frozen. When God created the heaven and the earth in Genesis chapter 1, whatever was out here was waters or frozen waters. And God literally took His finger and inscribed a circle upon the face of the deep. That's what the Bible says for itself. You can read it and you can come back later and read it again. How was the earth formed? Well, the Bible tells us that too in Job 38. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. Job tells us that the earth is as clay pressed with a seal. What does this mean? A picture is worth a thousand words. You see, this is a seal like royalty of old would use when they would stamp their insignia on something. This was verifying that it was uh, authorized by them or they were claiming ownership to it. A royal decree had to have the king's seal upon it. The scrolls in Revelation. That's right. And those seals are pressed into wax or as Job tells us, sometimes in clay and then it hardens into that shape. This is a picture of a, a seal that has pressed into wax, which would be the same thing it would do if you pressed it into clay. But the Bible describes the creation of the earth. It is turned as clay to the seal. And they, speaking of the heavens above, they stand as a garment. So the garment of the heavens is above the earth. The earth is turned as clay to the seal. That is what Job tells us the earth looked like when God created it. Preacher, that's not anything like the picture that was in my ninth grade book. That's what the Bible says, that the earth uh, is turned as clay to the seal. 
The Bible talks about the face of the earth. I'm not going to read all of these verses because there are these, and as you see, plus another 50 verses in the Bible that talk about the face of the earth. You can look them up if you want to read all of them. The face of the earth. The face of all the earth. The face of the earth. The face of the earth. The face of the earth. Genesis. Amos. And many other places, more than 50 other verses in the Bible that talk about the face of the earth. Then the Bible also talks about the face of the waters. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That frozen deep we saw from the book of Job. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. This, of course, is the flood. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. Then in Genesis chapter 8... The waters were on the face of the whole earth. So the earth has the face of the earth. The waters of the earth are described as the face of the waters upon the earth. But what is a face? The definition of face, this is the dictionary definition, not my definition. Face is any of the individual flat surfaces of a solid object. All objects that are said to have a face have a flat surface. There's the face of a clock. There's the face of a die. There's the face of a cliff. The face of a sundial. The face of a golf club. The face of a plate. All of these things that we talk about in our common vernacular that have faces on them have one thing in common. That is they all have a flat side to them. What is a face? Any of the individual flat surfaces of a solid object. Here are some objects that do not have a face. Do you notice something that all these have in common? Well, there's a kickball. There's no face on a kickball. There's a softball. There's no face on a softball. There's a cannonball. There's no face that you can detect on a cannonball. It's all the same all the way around. There's no face, unless you carve one, on a watermelon or a pumpkin. There are no faces on any of these things that you see pictured because they're the same all the way around them. And furthermore, there's no flat side on any of these items. That's what's in common between them. The Bible identifies the shape of the earth. In Revelation chapter 20 verse 9, it says they went up on the breadth of the earth. If you look up the Greek word for breadth, you'll see that uh, the word breadth comes from the word platus, which which means width or breadth of something. And then it tells you to go back to uh, the the word from which it's formed, platus. If you look up platus, it says wide. If you look up the word platus, it comes from the word plasso, which means spread out flat, broad, or wide. So the word breadth of the earth applies to something that is flat and spread out in a flat surface. This is the Hebrew model of the creation of the world. Now this particular image was taken from Logos Bible software. It is a a Bible software anybody can pay for. It's rather expensive, but if you pay for it, you're allowed to use their images. This is the, the ancient Hebrew understanding of the shape of the earth and creation of the earth. You see that the earth is a circle, and above it is spread out a tent, which is called the firmament up above. We'll say more about the firmament, Lord willing, two weeks from tonight, It's a totally different subject altogether. The ancient Hebrews believed that the the great deep, the depth, was underneath and around the earth. The earth itself was a flat circle with a tent stretched out above it in all directions, just like we saw illustrated in the picture a little while ago. That's That's the way the Israelites understood and perceived God created the earth. Preacher, that's totally different than what we were taught in science class. It's totally different than what NASA says. 
It's totally different than what's at the beginning of every Hollywood movie I see when I see that spinning globe come on Universal Pictures and others as well. I know that's different. And I know it's totally different than everything you and I have been taught our entire lives. And by the way, what I'm telling you right now is something that when I began to see it for the first time, I spent the next 12 months digging out everything that you're seeing in this presentation and a whole lot more that I don't have time to present. You have the advantage or disadvantage, whichever you choose to view it, of having all of this brought together in eight weeks instead of having the course of a year to take it in, mull it over, and then come up with what you believe about it. But what I'm presenting to you is what the Bible says. The Bible gives a very clear picture of the shape of the earth and how the earth was made. It goes totally against everything you and I have been taught all our lives. Preacher, what are we supposed to do with that? Well, if NASA is right, if modern science is right, you know, it's not going to affect your day-to-day -day life in any way. But I don't know about you, but I choose just to believe the Bible. When we talked about the things we've seen over the last three weeks, we've seen time and time again the things that science says and the fact that they have no real science to prove their position. Rather, they have one theory upon a theory upon a theory. Because when it comes down to it, Everything they believe in their model of cosmology goes totally against this book. And I'm going to submit to you that everything they have presented in their view of how everything is put together and how it's made, what it's made of, and how it looks is all for the purpose of you not believing this book. And you heard in their own words in the film we watched last week that there is no limit to the extent they will go to deny the existence of God and to deny this book. So you can believe, if you'd like, that they would never tell us something that wasn't true about the shape of the earth. I don't choose to believe that. They have a different religion. Their sole purpose is to disprove, or rather not disprove, but deny the existence of God and the existence of what this book says to be true. All right, let's continue on. Here are some other ancient models of the world. Following the flood, when God confounded man's language at the Tower of Babel and forced mankind to scatter, everywhere that man went, he took with him two things. Number one was the religion of mystery Babylon, which forms the basis for every worldwide religion other than biblical Christianity and ancient Judaism. And number two they took with them some of the truths that had been known by Noah and his family, including the story of a worldwide flood and also how the earth was created. Every single ancient civilization, in fact, every not-so-ancient civilization up to 500 years ago had the exact same model in their science, their history, their culture of how the earth was shaped and created. You see, the ancient Egyptian view is a flat surface with some kind of a dome above. The Norse version is a tree growing up, and on top of the tree is a disc with some kind of circular something over the top. Looks kind of like a cake server. Then you have the Hindu version, uh, which we referenced several weeks ago. A, a turtle with a disc on top and a snake forming a circle above the earth. The Mayans, the same thing. A flat disk with some kind of shell above it. The Incas, same thing. The Navajo Indians in southwest United States, the same thing. The Hebrew model, we already looked at it, same thing. The only one that's different is the one that just showed up recently, NASA's view of what the world looks like. Why is it that for 5,500 years, every civilization 
that left the Tower of Babel all knew, all had the same version, the same story of what the earth looked like and how it was created. I know they, their stories may differ. One's got a turtle. There's a snake. There's some other odd-looking things. But they all have the same shape to them. A flat disk with some kind of a dome above it. Why? It's because that's what Genesis chapter 1 teaches as well. Think for just a minute. Don't say anything out loud, by the way. What's the main reason that you think the earth is a globe? Come on, you know. The main reason that you believe the earth is a sphere. Is it because you've been up in a rocket? To see it for yourself? Probably not. Is it because your dad went up in a rocket and took a Polaroid snapshot for you? Probably not. Why then? Please don't answer out loud. Why then? Why does most everyone in the world today believe that the earth is a globe, a ball, when 500 years ago virtually no one on earth believed it? In spite of what modern scientists want you to believe, Virtually no one believed that 500 years ago. Go ahead. Say it. Don't say it, by the way. That's just what the slide says. Say it to yourself, but not out loud. The main reason I believe the earth is a globe is because thus and such. Now, don't say it out loud. I have pieces of paper. Uh, Brother Bob, would you come help me with this? Brother Bob, would you give every person one of those pieces of paper and and a pen too, if you don't mind. If there aren't enough, I've got some more up here. Now don't say anything out loud. Don't poke each other and give any uh, look on each other's paper. Mitch, don't cheat off somebody else's paper back there. (laughs) What I'm going to do is, Brother Bob's going to give everybody a piece of paper, and what I want you to do when you get that paper is I want you to number one and two. And besides those, beside those two numbers, I want you to tell me the top two reasons that you, at least up to tonight, have all your life believed that the earth is a ball, a globe. I want you to put the top two reasons on there. Actually write it down. Don't just keep it in your head. I'm not going to take them up, but put it down on paper. What are the top two reasons that you all your life have believed the earth is a globe, a ball, a sphere? Write those two things down if you would. Number one, the the, the main reason you believe it. Number two, the second main reason you've always believed that your entire life. All right, I'm not going to take a whole lot of time on this now, so just write it quickly enough that you can read it if nobody else. You're the only one that needs to be able to read your own writing here. Thank you, Brother Bob. You need a pen? You got one? Okay. The main reason I believe it is a globe is because thus and such. Number one reason and number two reason. All right. Anybody need more time? You've at least jotted something down for your two points. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a couple of guesses here before we go any further, and let's see. Just by raising your hand, you don't have to say anything. Just raise your hand. How many of you, for one of your two answers, you put uh, the pictures of the Earth from outer space? All right. Several people. All right. How many of you put a ship going over the horizon? Anybody put that? Nobody put that. All right. So if you put something other than those two things, uh, I'm going to break my own rule, and this is your opportunity to say something before we go any further. But just uh, we'll keep it short so we can move on to the next slide because I've got a video coming up here. Tr, what's one of the reasons you put down um, other than the two I guessed? consistently made fun of and argued with and especially by family members who 
you know, that I was raised. Okay, so let me just cut that short. Family members, okay? Uh, somebody else, yes, sir? School and university. School and university. Okay, what you were taught in school and university. Brother Kevin? Balloon appears to be spiritual, so... Uh, okay. So drawing an inference that if the moon is spherical, then the earth by default should be also. Okay. Anybody else? Something besides the ones we've already heard? The globe that they fell around. Okay, that, that, that mankind has circumnavigated the globe. Is that what you're saying? That we've sailed around it? Okay. All these are good. We're going to talk about a lot of these this week and next week. What's that? They've flown around it and they've sailed around it, right. circumnavigating the globe. All right, we're going to come back to these things, by the way. I, I, I want to say that tonight what my desire is for this part of the study, tonight I'm presenting for the most part the, what the Bible says about the shape of the earth and how the earth was made. At the end of tonight, as we're getting into where we're getting into now, and all of next week, I'll be presenting what things other than the Bible demonstrate about the shape of the earth that supports what the Bible says. So we're doing things basically the same way we've done the first three nights of this Bible study. We're looking at what does the Bible say first, and then how does actual observable experimental science either support or deny the claims made in the Bible. So up to this point, all we've done tonight really is look at what does the Bible say, all right? What you're going to see for the rest of tonight and all of next week are some things that are going to be totally different than you've ever seen presented before. They're all observable experimental science that say that what the scientists have been telling us doesn't hold water. But what the Bible model says is evidenced by the things we see around us and experiments that can be reproduced over and over again. A picture is worth a thousand words. Tell the truth. The main reason that you have believed the earth is a sphere is because of the NASA, NASA images of the earth, right? I know some of you didn't put that as your main answer, but for most of us, we've seen that picture our whole lives we saw it in the corner of kindergarten over against the wall uh, on a stand of some kind where there was a globe. We've seen it in every classroom we've been in our entire lives. We see it at the beginning of every Hollywood motion picture in the opening credits. And we see it in everything that comes out of NASA and the U.S. Space Agency or any other governmental space agency around the world. Like this picture of the earth taken by NASA in 2002 called the Big Blue Marble. How many of you have ever heard of the Big Blue Marble? That's the picture. One year it was the, 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 the main picture on the iPhone. When you would open up the iPhone apps, uh, uh, it was right there as the, the home page or whatever that's called. Or this one from 2012. There's the one from 2002. Here's the one from 2012. Both of these are NASA images, by the way. Both of them come from the NASA website. 2002, 2012. But wait. Why is North America so much larger in the 2012 NASA photo of Earth than the 2002 photo of Earth? from NASA. Wait a minute, if they're both photos, why does this one have North America so much larger than that one? If they're both photos, something's not right. <laughs> or perhaps these NASA photos. There's 2012 and there's 2015. Huge differences in the shape of North America in these two photos of the earth. Again, these came from the NASA website. If two things are different, they cannot be the same. 
There's a good reason that even the size of North America doesn't look the same in the various NASA photos. I'm calling them photos very loosely. NASA says they're photos. In case it isn't already painfully obvious, none of the NASA photos of Earth are actual photos of Earth. Just like the photos from Mars they've been showing us recently aren't actual photos of Mars either. Every single one is a digital picture literally created by graphic design artists working at a computer. They even admit it. So perhaps the real question is, if they've supposedly been to space so many times, why don't we have any actual photographs of the earth? Why are they giving us, uh, why are they giving us digital images instead of just shooting the picture or shooting the video for us to see? Now, here's where I have to go to my other device here and see if I can get the first video we have for tonight to come up. And in 2002, Blue Marble 2.0, NASA's Rob Simmon made this. And it had wide appeal too. For example, it ended up as the default background on the iPhone. I didn't even know until I bought an iPhone um, and turned it on and kind of did a little happy dance. Simmons' job is... It's primarily taking data and making pictures out of it. That's what this is. A composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. The, to us, the really cool thing was the data set. Up until that point, there was no realistic color map of the globe anywhere. So the land layer here comes from... The Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer aboard Terra. And the tricky part here was the weather. So we actually had to take clouds out. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it was a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it it's, has to be. Then there was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just hit Command Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. What I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space, but I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. So this fella is a NASA artist who has admitted that the photo of the Earth that was put out in I think 2002, that the video or the picture that was portrayed as a photo of the Earth by NASA in 2002, which if my memory serves me correctly, was the first supposed photo of the Earth NASA had produced since the last moon mission in the early 1970s. It was photoshopped. It was a totally created digital image that was made from scratch, supposedly using scientific data, but it wasn't a photo at all. Now, we've got to go back to our main presentation here. NASA photoshopping at its worst. Now, the guy admitted it in the video. He said, I hit control V. Uh, I used control V regularly when he was creating it. And for those that don't know, control C copies, control V pastes. So they were copying these clouds and pasting them over here and over here and over there. These, uh, the people, whoever did this particular uh, picture, They've circled the things that have been copied and pasted. You can see how they're identical. They're just duplicated all over the, the image instead of using real clouds. Why? Because they didn't take an actual photo of the earth. It's just a digital image that was created. But the question begs to be asked, why not just take the photo? I mean, they supposedly have the Hubble uh, telescope out there somewhere... All these other probes that have gone thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of miles from Earth, supposedly, why not just turn one of those telescopes around and 
click, take a picture back at the earth. But that's not all. As if copy and paste wasn't enough. On the left, we have a cloud formation in one of NASA's photos of the earth. You can see the red arrow pointing to the particular cloud formation we're talking about. On the right is a very similar cloud formation from Disney's Lion King movie. Disney took a lot of heat over this when the Lion King movie came out. The Christian Family Research Council and a number of other Christian um, organizations uh, protested the movie because they were putting in subconscious, subliminal messages that were inappropriate for any audience, let alone children. But can I just tell you, Disney does that all the time. And even the things that, you, that aren't subliminal. They use very crude, rude, vulgar innuendo in all the modern Disney animated cartoons and Pixar movies, etc. Just stay away from them. But, but look what it says. Disney and NASA have close ties going all the way back to the founding of NASA, but more about that later. Now, I am working right now feverishly trying to put together one final study to complete our study that would be a ninth part of this Bible study that is just the connections between NASA and stuff they shouldn't be connected with. Disney and NASA have been working together since the very foundation, the very creation of NASA. It's their artists that are doing these things. Here they are putting the word S-E-X in the Lion King There's the exact same word over on one of the photos of the big blue marble in an official NASA photo. Folks, these people are Satanists. And their agenda is to destroy people's belief in God, the Bible, and to destroy the fabric that underlies our very society. But NASA has a long history of doctoring images also and staging photos. Now these are some of the moon landing photos. The one on the far left, you see inside that red circle, you see a piece of equipment that they supposedly took to the moon with them, and yet mysteriously, the crosshairs from the lens of the camera is behind the object. Now if you have crosshairs on a camera lens to help you zoom in on something, The crosshairs are always, always, always going to be on the top of whatever you're shooting when the picture comes out because they're etched into the the lens itself. And yet there's one, a NASA image of the moon landings that's obviously doctored. Here's another one, a very famous one with the supposed moon rover. Uh, There again, there are the crosshairs of the lens, but the moon... Uh, rover is somehow gotten in front of the crosshairs on the lens itself of the picture. Here's another rock that's in one of the scenes of the moon landing photographs. You can find these yourself, but it's got a C on it. A preacher, that, that's probably just some abnormal f- uh, shape on a rock on the moon. Well, there's a reason that on movie sets, Different props have letters on them. Now the letters, the object's supposed to be turned on a movie set so you can't see the letters, but the letter is there for placement on the movie set so you know exactly where that item's supposed to sit on the set. Apparently someone forgot to turn it over and the C was left upright. Preacher, I think that was just a coincidence. There was a rock that had a C on it. You can believe that if you want to. Uh, but nevertheless. What about the pictures from the moon? Now this is supposedly a picture of earth from the moon. A NASA picture of the earth from the moon. There are a couple of problems with it. First of all, in none of the NASA photos supposedly taken from the moon can you see any stars visible. Uh, The second problem has to do with the camera they took anyway and whether it would even function under the the harsh uh, heat and cold that they say is on the moon. But, be that as it may, if you were on the side of the moon facing the earth where they say all of those moon landings took place, 
Every one of those is on the side of the moon looking right back at the earth. There was not a single time that they were supposedly anywhere on the moon where they would be looking at the earth coming up over the horizon of the moon. There, if, if you don't know this already, the, the, the face of the moon or the side of the moon facing the earth is always the side of the moon facing the earth. All the time. It's why they talk about the dark side of the moon because it never faces the earth. If all of their landings were on the front side of the earth, uh, of the moon facing the earth, how would you come up with a picture of the earth coming up over the horizon of the moon? Obviously, another staged NASA photo because it's good for effect seeing the earth come up over the horizon of the moon. Would NASA intentionally deceive? The whole history of NASA since its beginnings is steeped in the occult, Freemasonry, and imported Nazi scientists. Their history and agenda are better suited for a future presentation in our ongoing Mystery Babylon series. But the question about their trustworthiness related to the earth is specifically in question here. Why would they try to hide pictures of the earth from the public? Would they intentionally deceive the public? Watch the following video and see for yourself. Now, I'm leaving out one of the videos that I intended to show you tonight. It's, it's about two minutes long. Do you want me to leave the two-minute video out or do you want to see the two-minute video? We're, okay, we're about to watch a nine-minute video and that's the end tonight. So we've got 11 minutes. Do you want the two-minute or just the nine-minute one? All right, I'm going to show both of them if you have to go. I understand that too. Here's the two-minute video. It goes with the one you saw a moment ago. In the meantime, they are images that inspire, educate, and sometimes just make us say, wow. Yeah. Over the years, NASA has given us spectacular photos and renderings that reveal a colorful and mysterious universe. No doubt. And now Chris Martinez is introducing us to two of the artists behind some of the most iconic space art in the galaxy. In a small, bright office, working side by side, let's see, uh, Robert Hurt and Tim Pyle bring the universe to life. What we're doing does have real science underlying it. Robert is an astrophysicist turned artist. Tim, once a Hollywood animator, is now a planet illustrator. Together, they produce some of NASA's most popular images, from renderings of how planets light years away could look to actual photos of stars and galaxies captured by NASA's powerful telescopes. And this is sort of how it comes to me. And then I Many of those know. images have a dark, grainy start, but color and light reveal an astonishing glimpse of how the deepest regions of space might appear to the human eye. What I'm trying to do is show people sort of the, the broader colors that the universe has to offer. It's a delicate blend of imagination and data. The artists meet with NASA scientists over many drafts to ensure a planet or galaxy's look lines up with the research to make each one as accurate as possible. I love the challenge. It's kind of like a puzzle to me of trying to create something that looks really cool within the restrictions that were given by the scientists. It can take days, even weeks, to produce just a single image. The dazzling final results, enough to keep us all dreaming of the final frontier for years to come. Chris Martinez, CBS News, Pasadena, California. The artists also say they have to be especially careful when it comes to illustrations of other planets to avoid colors many of us would associate with Earth, like blue for water. The force is strong with this. The all right, so all of those pictures of Mars that you've been shown, those are the two guys or guys just like them that have produced those photos of Mars and photos of the Earth. All right, let me bring up the, the next video. This is uh, the last one. Uh, before I do that, there's a description of what you're about to see, and I'd like for you to see the description before we see the video. What about the Apollo videos of Earth? During the Apollo 11 moon landing, the first one that took place in July of 1969, astronaut Neil Armstrong and his fellow travelers claimed to be showing footage shot with a camera pressed to a window aboard their capsule approximately halfway to the moon. The public was told that the round shape visible in the camera was the Earth. They were told that the camera was at the back of the capsule 
all the dark around the, uh, the earth was space, and the earth in the middle was looking out the window of the capsule. In 2018, however, the original NASA reel was accidentally sent on loan to a reporter who discovered that the reel showed the astronaut staging a pretend shot of the round earth by shooting at the window from several feet away inside the capsule instead of up against the glass with cutouts placed around the window to create the impression of a round earth even though it was just a small portion of the earth shot while still in low earth orbit. In other words, they were up real high above the earth, but they weren't in outer space. And what they were showing was looking back down at the earth, but it wasn't the whole earth, it was just part of the earth that you could see through a round window. The entire sequence is featured in the film A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon by filmmaker Bart Sabrell, and you can find the entire video, and it's free to watch at sabrell.com. All right, so let's see the, the actual nine-minute cut out of that. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr., and Neil Armstrong, staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind-the-scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the Earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason prior to the mission, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th, and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. Furthermore, it is apparent they are in genuine zero gravity aboard the actual spacecraft, necessary to convince the mass media of their authenticity, just not any further than Earth orbit, as you will see. In this never-before-seen or heard footage, not only is the radio conversation between the astronauts and Houston Control audible, there is a secondary, private conversation taking place between the crew and a third confidential party, prompting the astronauts with what to say, when to speak, and how to effectively manipulate the camera to achieve the desired misleading effect. NASA claims that the Houston transmissions were the only ones taking place with the astronauts. Listen now as Houston Control initiates a conversation with the crew, only to find them too preoccupied with the the behind-the-scenes trickery to respond. Moments pass and the oversight is picked up on by the clandestine third party who quickly prompts them with talk. Immediately, Neil Armstrong speaks. Hello, Apollo 11. Houston, Goldstone says that the TV looks great. Over. Again, the illusion they are attempting to create is the Earth at a distance to demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. Understand, too, that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public, and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private until now. Here they discuss that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. Hi, Roger Neal. We just wanted a narrative such that we can, when we get to playback, we can sort of correlate what we're saying. Thank you very much. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a uh, a, uh, number one window and there isn't any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. 
Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That is why they wanted the interior dark and blocked out the sun from entering through the other windows. Here you can see the extruded window, probably two inches thick at the bottom. This is because the Earth's shine is coming in at a downward angle. It also causes the Earth to appear to be an irregularly shaped circle, for you are seeing the outside of the window at the bottom and the inside of the window at the top, which together form two different sized halves of a circle. Subsequently, this take was never used. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. During this segment, intended to be edited and played back later for the worldwide television audience, dated July 18, 1969, Neil Armstrong condemns himself as he states that he is 130,000 miles out, or halfway to the moon, as the NASA flight log also states on this date, when he is in reality in low Earth orbit of a few hundred miles. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11. Calling in from about 130,000 miles out. And, uh, Here, during another segment, also intended to air after review, Neil Armstrong falsely explains to the viewers how the shot is attained by putting the camera's lens to the window's glass, as it would have to be if they were the claimed distance away from the Earth. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with the TV camera. If the window was completely filled up with a TV camera, as he stated, then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. You can also notice how the astronaut operating the camera reacted to the mistake by attempting to pan away from it. This is a segment that they believed wasn't even being recorded, much less suitable for broadcast, for the lens was being zoomed out and the scene was being changed to that of an interior of the astronauts at work and apparently the stop button popped back up on the recorder without notice. Here is the diffused work light that they used to see camera controls, but not throw light onto the spacecraft's wall. Here they remove part of the crescent insert. Finally, the iris is opened up and you can see the real location of the camera and the very bright and near Earth out the window. Here is the slate for the 19th of July, and the same shot of trickery on the 19th of July, and then the 20th, and the same misleading shot on the 20th. Later that evening, they were said to be walking on the moon. How can this be when they were in Earth orbit only nine hours earlier, and the moon is some three days journey away? Furthermore, if they genuinely went to the moon, why would they be faking any part of it? Why this trickery with the window? By faking being halfway to the moon, it becomes apparent that they did so because they could not even go halfway. It thus confirms that the stumbling block to their success was the lethal radiation of the Van Allen radiation belts. Since the same equipment was used on the subsequent missions in the 40 months that followed, None of them could have gone to the moon. They only increased their proficiency at staging them. 
When some TV viewers of the second man mission to the moon telephoned the networks complaining that reruns of I Love Lucy were being interrupted, it became clear that for the taxpayers, once was enough. But it wasn't enough for the government and contractors. Billions of dollars of pure profit went with each return. How coincidental that the following mission would have the element of life and death jeopardy. All right, so let's close out the, the presentation for tonight. You saw the, the video there. They were clearly faking a shot, uh, saying they were halfway to the moon. There is a mountain of evidence that suggests that the moon landings in their entirety were faked. I don't have time to go into that. That's not what the purpose of this is. That's not part of the Bible study. I'll be happy to send you as many videos on that as you want to look at in your own time. But, but all of the NASA supposed photos of the earth from outer space that show it to be a ball, a sphere, a globe, they're all made up images. None of them are actual photos. Why would they fake images if there were images. An old Rio received. What about the high altitude photos? This is the last slide for tonight. Hundreds of high altitude photos taken from airplanes, homemade rockets, and even hot air balloons purport to show the curvature of the earth. See, both of these appear to show the earth being curved. What every one of these photos has in common is either being shot through a window with curved glass, as is the case on many aircraft, or being shot with a camera with a fisheye lens for producing wide-angle shots, like many of the consumer GoPro cameras on the market. The reason these both look like the Earth is curved is because they're shooting with a fisheye lens that makes everything curved so you can get a wide-angle shot. It's obvious these are fisheye lenses because... Even the string hanging down outside this, uh, this lens on this balloon, even the string appears to be curved because it's a fisheye lens making everything curved. All the supposed images you've seen of high altitude photos of the earth showing the curvature of the earth, they're all shot with fisheye lenses. None of them are shot with actual lenses. That's what it looks like with a regular lens. Next week, the entire time that we're together will be one evidence, one scientific proof after another that supports that the shape that the Bible says is the shape of the earth is the shape of the earth. Preacher, this is a lot to be taken in and this is this is a whole lot to even be considering that we might have been lied to even about the shape of the earth. I'm going to tell you, don't feel bad if you're having trouble accepting what you've seen and heard tonight. It took me an entire year of going through one thing after another to come to a final conclusion for myself that, hey, it's not what we've been told it is. And I just want to tell you, standing here tonight, your pastor, for the last three years, has believed 100% that the earth is not a globe, it is not a ball, it is a flat circular disk with a dome above it called the firmament. The, all next week, we're going to talk more about the proofs of it being a flat earth, not a globe. The week after that, Lord willing, we're going to talk about the firmament what the Bible says about the firmament and how it compares to what science says. The part about the firmament to me was what sealed the deal for believing the earth is the shape the Bible says it is. But we've got to get to there. So, a lot to take in. Mull it around. Go back over the passages we saw from the Bible. But the Bible is very clear about what the shape of the earth is. I suggest to you the best thing you and I could do is what Martin Luther said to do. Just believe the Bible for what it says. I know if you go and tell your neighbor 
that you believe the earth is not a ball, it's not a globe, it's a flat circular disk, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to say you're a kook, you're a nut, you're wacko. But the truth is, what the Bible says is the most important. When you see the things that you're going to see next week, it's the other crowd that are the nuts, the wackos, that are believing things that are unbelievable. Why? Most of the people, it's just because that's what they've been taught all their lives. It's what you've been taught all your life. It's what I was taught all my life. Am I standing here tonight telling you that I believe that the earth is a flat disk with a firmament over it like a dome because I, I enjoy uh, people looking at me like I've got three heads or something? No. But over the period of an entire year of looking into this almost day in and day night and night, I totally believe exactly what the Bible says and what I've shared with you tonight. You're going to see next week a lot more of the proofs and evidences for it that I haven't even come close to getting to tonight. I hope you'll be here next week. Don't leave here tonight and say, hey, that's, I'm not even going to go back. I'm not even going to hear what the evidences are. Come back next week and see for yourself. That's what I encourage you to do. Just see it for yourself. You pray about it. It took me a year to get to the point I'm asking you to get to in two weeks. I know that's a lot to ask. But when you begin to accept that the Bible is exactly, the earth is exactly the way the Bible says it is, it answers every other question that there is. Everything makes sense. And uh, I encourage you, just keep praying about it and be here next week. Now, I promised I'd give time for questions or comments. I know you might need to leave. If you do, that's okay. But is there anybody that has questions or comments?